A warm welcome to everyone for our PC Quest 35 years journey from 1987 to 2022. Today we will be discussing XR for every citizen and every industry. To discuss that futuristic concept, we have Shravant Aluru, founder and CEO of Avatar.me. Welcome, Shravant. Thanks, Rain. All my pleasure. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll get straight to it. You know, like we have titled it XR for every citizen and every industry because you know X XR is still not that a familiar term. You know, XR stands for extended reality, which is being used as an umbrella term for AR, VR, and MR. So usually, I think it would be better if you simplify these terms for the common listener before we can go forward. Sure, Sunil. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, these these j the, the jargon that's used is usually AR um, interchanged with XR and, and MR being kind of a mix of both. Um, but you're right. Extended reality is usually the right term to talk about the umbrella extended reality concept. And you know, my, my view of this, Sunil, would be just think of it as an underlying shift from the 2D digital world today into something that's more life-size 3D. Now, when you're talking augmented reality, it's about dropping and augmenting the physical reality. So, you know, you, you're the center of the experience, you're dropping something around you. <clears throat> Equally extended reality, I would say, the virtual reality aspect of it uh, is more the classic Facebook way of looking at metaverse in the sense that you're, you're transported into a virtual mall or a world and then experiencing it within a virtual world perhaps dynamically interacting with others as well in a social um, setup or a gamified setup. Um, now that is the classic VR that we see today. And then there is this mixed reality aspect, which is, you know, the, I would say the confluence of both in the sense that something that can switch between these two and be interoperable would be the best way to put it. But in each of these, um, the underlying shift, I would say, is the native 2D formats that we see today, which are the digital web pages and the content on flat screens all of that shifting into a life-size 3D. Um, and I think that that's the inflection that you'll see next decade as we evolve in the sophistication in terms of hardware, which will which is needed to make the switch, equally software, which is gonna be capitalizing on these new capabilities and building AI and computer vision on top that does things that we couldn't do yesterday. Um, but where I do certainly see all of this converging, Sunil, is what I call as a multiverse in the sense that, you know, if you were to think about Web3 and the common theme of decentralizing the control into the user's hand, think of, you know, the entire extended reality as an attempt to take experience and make the consumer the protagonist, right? It's equally about making the user the center of the experience and then spawning the digital worlds around them. Um, so I do see them converging with Web3 and both of them together, perhaps make the entire system be user-centric and empowering the users rather than the current way of a platform having the control. So, uh, that's that's very fascinating and I'm sure it's going to be a very long journey to the you know multiverse but the thing is like uh, a day may come when you know you'll have enough gadgets and devices around you that uh, it, your whole world around you will be different but right now we are entering these realities just through a headset. So can you speak about the possibilities and limitations of this headset that we will be wearing? Yep. So Neil, in fact, you're spot on. Um, you know, Metaverse to me is at least a decade away. And, and that's primarily because we're not even in a headset era yet. We are, most of what we do at Avatar, or in fact is happening today in the 3D world is on mobile phone. The advantage is the camera on the mobile phone became intelligent and it had compute that got added with the CPU, GPU improvements that we saw. And both of them together today allow us to say, drop um, furniture into a consumer space and help them look at their living space and how does it look before making the purchase decision. Um, that is honestly the utility value that we see today. There is also a novelty value that, that has been discovered in gaming, entertainment, media, and those industries. We don't focus on it at a, from an avatar perspective, but we've seen a lot of uh, action and consumer traction in those industries. But it's very nascent today. It's through a mobile phone. There's honestly no real headset of penetration that could be tapped from a consumer standpoint. So that is something that I think will happen as Apple brings their smart glass, which is announced to be next year. Uh, we've seen a lot of good traction with Quest 2, 
um, from Meta's side, that, that's the device that has solved a lot of hardware problems that used to exist from a consumer experience perspective. But if you remember the mobile revolution, right, I'll maybe brought, drop the analogy to the, to, so, and Sunil, you would have seen this in, in far more maturity than I did. But early uh, 2000s, if you notice, Windows Mobile was there, BlackBerry was there. They were touchless phones with physical keyboards that would come out, if you remember. Um, but, you know, it was waiting for that moment of UX, which I think Apple iPhone did, post which it truly became a consumer phenomenon, right? It was still an enterprise phenomenon before Apple entered the market. And that's where I see the market today. If you see what we're doing at Avatar, we're working with large commerce enterprises, bringing 3D to websites and making the same mobile phone literally a 3D device. Right uh, by the ability that you can now start walking around. I call it 2.5D because your screen is still 2D, but the, there's a six degrees of freedom in terms of you, you walking around, looking at an object. Now, the next evolution, like you rightly said, will be a headset. Um, now, I think it's very early to truly bet Sunil on which one will win the war. Uh, there's an AR smart glass approach, which is something similar to you seeing the physical reality and the ability to do digital overlays right um, on top of the shared physical reality that is one approach the other is a vr headset approach which is saying that i'll transport you into a complete virtual world and you'll start living your existence within those um, and then there's the third aspect which i think is the apple strategy of saying both will coexist but instead of one platform owning it the consumers will start saying these are what i want right so I could leave a sticky on my refrigerator for my wife to see a note and only share with her, which is virtual um, or, a, or a movie theater, for example, and think use cases like those. So I, I actually see this evolution probably not yet reaching the point where we can bet which one will take over. If you were to believe in Elon Musk, this could be a chip in our brains doing a human computer interface. But I think that's the natural HCI evolution that we're seeing. Uh, Sunil, at this point, all the giants have literally announced their ambition to own that computing platform. And I've seen billions of dollars being invested into this over the last 10 years. So I think it's a matter of when rather than enough today. But which one is still an early, early bet? So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't give you that. Yeah, so that's yeah. quite interesting. Like, you're right, we have like uh, still a time of possibility, four or five paths in front of us. It'll be interesting to maybe discuss one day what path we'll take. So then maybe yeah. then instead of going forward, sticking to the present, what are the current industries that are benefiting from XR? And what would you say show the greatest potential based on the work done today? That's a great question, Sunil. In fact, I think that is the first proof point I have on why I say this evolution is a matter of when rather than an if. Because what we're seeing, Sunil, is utility value today. And just purely by adding that spatial dimension to visual discovery, right? So at the heart of what Avatar is doing, we are trying to help the consumers make better purchase decisions by having a much more informed pre-purchase decision. Now that involves, for example, dropping a refrigerator in your kitchen. And then also, and, and Samsung's a client I can take names name off. So, with Samsung, for example, we allow a Samsung's consumer to drop a refrigerator in their kitchen, look at whether the color goes with the rest of the kitchen, whether it looks good, but equally start interacting with the feature discovery of the product, like open the fridge, look at cooling features, but then perhaps start playing with the smart screen that's on the, on the fridge door and start really looking at functional utility value of this product and then we've seen a correlation of that to the sales uplift. So to give you a sense, today on commerce, we've seen about three times sales uplift. The moment Avatar comes in and replaces a 2D listing of a product with the ability to open your camera, drop it, and have this experience. The second, uh, to your question, the second place where we've seen a lot of consumer emotional connect with the advent of 3D I would say is the gamification or the media and entertainment use case. Now we've been proud partners of both Google and Facebook ecosystem now, um, and done a lot of uh, you know kind of visual discovery experiences, which are more commerce driven. Think of this as a virtual mall or a virtual bike dealership that you're transported into. For example, we virtualized Auto Expo in early days of um, you know the the COVID era. And, and we literally let digital walk-ins happen into a auto expo. And in each of these 
what we saw is when Facebook would do a BL, BLS study comparing a 2D video ad versus a 3D enabled ad, we were seeing significantly higher click through rates. Equally, the traffic in terms of uh, the value we were bringing to a brand like Samsung, we were saying for a dollar that you spend, we will get you 2.5 times the users for the same dollar. And so the path to purchase funnel was just bloating up upfront with the same spend and thereby driving a lot more economics. And so that that's that's where I would say, Sunil, we got the evidence of saying 3D has a clear con uh, consumer impact and emotional connect in their behavior in certain areas. Um, that is what probably the giants are also betting on. They've all seen this early evidence. Um, we're all probably still early to say that there is a consumer experience that's truly life-size 3D, right? Uh, that is maybe a decade away. But if you see what um, Facebook did change their name to Meta, they're saying that 10 years hence, they see that to be the digital world driving a lot of their social interaction. So the buy-in and the writing on the wall is today, I think, quite evident. So it's like you've mentioned like what has happened till now, what are the industries where the action is happening, but you know, they talk in the future, like every industry is going to benefit from benefit from XR. So is that possible? Yeah. And also when I say every industry, I'd like to even intro introduce the government. Can the government also leverage this and how can it be used to empower the citizens? Yep. Uh, that's a great question. Sri. See, uh, there's obviously the web three aspect, which metaverse brings, which is adding more power to the user, right? More data privacy, more control, more ownership of what they bring to the table. So that is, uh, I'll, I'll leave that aside because that's well talked about. But I think more importantly than that, today, Sunil, if you look at AI and computer vision and together, they are why this whole XR phenomenon is happening. Underneath this XR term and the consumer journey lies a lot of advancements in terms of artificial intelligence, computer vision, and how these two together today, think of this as a camera and a software behind, surpassing the human eye and the brain that's behind the eye, right? Uh, in specific narrow use cases. Now it can't compete with the fuzziness that we bring in, long way to go, but think of a security guard. A camera today is far more productive than a security guard to find anomalies work 24 by 7, no weekends, no health problems, you know, complete coverage, right? So in those senses, I think a lot of the grunt work that hasn't been done in India today can be automated. And that is a very, very powerful government strategy if you think of productivity and GDP and the impact it can bring. And I think today Indian government has already understood the efficacy. You can see a lot of initiatives happening in this. And the best analogy I can draw the, to this is uh, forget the consumer experience, but if you think about industrial use cases or delivery or logistics, you already see AR quietly doing a lot of work. There's a lot of robotics that's come in. There's a lot of image detection that's already eliminating and bringing productivity and helping humans do the better job, right? Uh, I don't think this is going to eat, eat into human jobs. I think there's long way for AI to truly create any threat of that nature in my perspective. Having said that, I think it will remove a lot of inefficiencies and in the process bring a lot of advantages with it. That's at least how I see the knife. Uh, hopefully we use it to cut vegetables rather than, you know, uh, the other uses of knives. Yeah. So, I mean, you've, you've set the stage, we've got a basic idea of what is happening. So now I'd like you to go maybe a bit while tell us, tell us about the future, because like, what is the world of XR going to be like without the headset? Maybe like, because right now, as you said, we are at an inflection point, the metaverse is really gaining buzzword. Web3 is gaining uh, neural link, everything is happening and every device is now going to cater to, uh, you know, the future metaverse. So what will will we all one day live in this virtual metaverse and what kind of it will be, you know, created by so many devices, which we cannot imagine now, if you could um, just speak into the future. No, I think that feels like beginning of internet, Sunil. Um, I, I mean, I think the last time I felt like this was back in nine, 1990s, right? Or early, mids of 90s. And I think we are exactly there. It, what you'll see is standards coming through. I don't think one platform will own this. It will be like World Wide Web, um, but the Web3 equivalent of it, where every consumer will have the ability to start spawning experiences from their focal po viewpoint, right? Um, so they'll be the center of every digital experience rather than a flat screen that everyone goes to. 
Today it's a flat web page that everyone has to go to. Instead, it will be pull versus push. You will see that the control in the consumer will go up and experientially, I think it will be a blend of shared physical reality and then layers on shared physical reality that get built. Um, some that are public, like Eiffel Tower could have a virtual Gucci mall right outside it. Equally, there'll be some that are shared between social circles, like I could maybe drop a movie theater, only share it with my wife, and the two of us are enjoying a big theater, while my kid is maybe, you know, playing a game, not realizing, um, you know, there's a theater here. And all those kind of use cases of starting to manipulate our own physical reality. And the reason I say this, Sunil, is I think that is the true fundamental value prop that this technology upgrade brings, right? Um, what it does is it makes the user the center of the experience and also opens up the tools, which is now three dimensional around the user. Um, we call it the shared physical reality, but the reality is if I'm sitting today in a room with you, you seeing behind me, I'm seeing behind you, and we're probably already living two different worlds while being in the same physical space. And that's the power of probably the technology shift that you'll also see. Communication will get disrupted. Um, why would you need a TV screen? Why would you need a movie theater? Why would you need a lot of these, um, you know, even climate-wise bad ec um, ecological decisions of materialism can be avoided by virtual overlays that are equally relevant for your sensory perception. So what I, I truly see happening is a lot of efficiency through this in the sense that you're not now able to have a virtually manipulated physical reality, which can be cut copy pasted like never before, right? It's the efficiency of cut copy paste coming into your own shared physical reality, which is, I think is very, very powerful. And it will manifest into early adopters looking like they're superhuman. Like the first guys who had the mobile phones with a 4G connection, you know, had Google on their knowledge at their fingertips. Similarly, what will happen is a salesman wearing one of these devices is seeing the LinkedIn bios of everyone who's walked into the room and has a lot more context about the person he's speaking with, right? And that's going to be superhuman compared to someone right next to him, not wearing the glass. And so I think the same thing that we saw with mobile will happen with this. The moment the first true consumer experience of that uh, device comes in. Now, again, as I said, I can't bet which one too early, but I'm very, very keen on Apple's smart glass because I personally, if you were to push me to take a call, Sunil, on, on the next five years, I see an iPhone, uh, you know, already being replaced with a smart glass. I don't see it in 2023 like everyone's talking about. I see this about five years from now, but I think that would be a, the first tectonic shift of consumers shifting from these flat digital worlds into something that is the way we are talking today, the metaverse or the multiverse that I keep talking about. But I hope that gives you a little bit of sense on how I see this evolving from where we stand today. As I said, thank you. That's quite fascinating. And I agree with you. This is like the beginning of a new tech journey. So I think the last time we met offline, this time we are meeting on Zoom. Maybe the next interview we'll be doing it in the multiverse. So that would be really something. A very good one. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you so much. It's it's been great talking to you. My pleasure, Sunil.